Hello everyone, this is Ariel Tayeb. In this video, I'm going to show you a game which was played between Rashid Najmuddinov and Oleg Chernikov. As you can see in my background, this is the photo of Rashid because we're showing his game. And today I'm going to, to show you the game, but I also want to do some kind, kind of an intro. I'm going to tell you about the history of this game. So if you're not interested in, in knowing stuff about this game, the history of this game, and you just want to watch the game, then you can skip a few minutes from now to a later stage of this video. Never mind, I'm going to tell you this game was played uh, in the 1962 USSR team championship. Uh, and in this game, Rashid played with the white pieces against Oleg Chirnikov. Uh, I don't know if I mentioned that already or not, but this was played in the 1962. Ah, yeah, sorry, I mentioned it. Um, and in th this game was played in the Sicilian Night or uh, Sicilian Dragon variation. And I'm going to, during the game as well, I'm going to tell you a specific story, it's a very interesting story. So in this game, Rashid had white pieces and he started with e4. Oleg Chernikov played, Chernikov played c5, knight f3, knight to c6, and d4, the open Sicilian, c takes d4, knight takes d4, g6, it's the accelerated dragon. So knight to c3, bishop to g7, bishop to e3. I'm not going to talk too much about the theory because this variation was played like thousands of times. So I'm going to just uh, skip to the most important part. Knight f6, bishop to c4, castle kingside, and bishop to b3. This is all uh, pretty much the main line. This is a completely theoretical line, bishop to b3. There are also players that like to play with f3. And against f3, there is some crazy lines with queen b6, uh, attacking the pawn on b2, and after bishop b3, there is just knight takes e4. Uh, there is a triple attack on the knight on d4, so white most of the time plays stuff like knight d5 and some complications. But never mind, because this never happened during this game. White just redraw his bishop back to b3. And there is no longer queen b6 with attack on the b2 pawn because there is the bishop on b3 that blocked the queen's access to the b2 square. So and black just played knight to g4. Now, typically in this position, black, black is playing d6, which is probably in the main line with bishop to d7 and rook c8, typical dragon structure. Uh, but here, just, just Oleg Chernikov probably prepared something. He played knight g4, and the, though the knight is hanging, white is not really winning material here, because if queen takes g4, which by the way was played in the game, if queen takes g4, there is just knight takes d4, and like queen takes g4, knight takes d4, black regain his piece. I mean, there are some variation you might want to look at. For example, if knight takes, if knight takes c6, so now, after to say like you are attacking black queen, and once the knight is captured, only then you want to take on g4. Well, black can just play d takes c6 at first, and now the bishop defends the knight on g4, and there is also a threat to just take the bishop on e3 and double white pawns. Uh, so, but there is even a much uh, sharper line like knight takes e3 seems more interesting. Because now white has a few options. For example, if knight takes c7, some type of a desperado move. So like white is saying, anyway, if I'm going to take this knight, my knight will be lost. So let's grab a pawn. And this is a desperado move. Queen takes e7 and now f takes c3. Well, black can't play bishop takes c3 check, remove the defender of the e4 pawn, and after the bishop takes the knight, then to take the pawn on e4. But I think even better is to start with queen h4 check, provoking g3, and only then bishop takes c3 check, and then taking on e4. And I mean, black's position is not winning or anything, but it's just more comfortable to play with black because he's attacking the rook on h1 and the pawn on e3. Uh, the only reasonable way I see to defend both is to play king to f2, or even king e2 or king b2, but why just lost his castling rights? and it's kind of an uncomfortable situation. White also has this horrible double double isolated pawns, uh, isolated pawn, isolated pawn, and his king is a bit exposed. But it's still holdable. It's not like uh, white is completely losing or anything.
and never mind let's go back to the game i mean knight take this wasn't played in the game all this complication the only move which was played in the game is knight g4 i never played knight takes c6 but i'm just uh, i just want to show you the variations so i'm just i just started analyzing knight takes e3 and uh, knight takes d8 is an option and now knight takes d1 rook takes d1 and rook takes d8 uh, yeah, this is a reasonable line that could have been played during the game. The material is equal. Black just has the bishop pair, and uh, um, Black's position is easier to play due to the fact the bishop on g7 kind of hanged the pawn on b2. I mean, once the knight moved, you must keep in mind that he need to, needs to stay in touch with the pawn on b2, and Black is a dark square bishop with no one to oppose him. So, I mean, Black's position is a little bit better here. So, I mean, when, when Chernikov, Chernikov played knight to g4, it's, it seems pretty much he was prepared against uh, Nezhmedinov. But uh, Rashid didn't took the knight on c6. He just played queen takes g4. And after knight takes d4, he played queen h4, of course, moving his queen away from the light square bishop diagonal. So he played queen h4, uh, queen a5, pinning the knight on c3 and preparing some tactics such as knight takes b3, followed by bishop takes c3 check. So white simply castled. And now, of course, knight takes b3 is a bit of an odd move because a takes b3 is possible due to the fact that white already castled and connected his rooks because when the king was on e1, this wasn't such a good idea because the rook on a1, you see this rook, if if the queen is attacking this rook and if the king was on e1 before castling black could simply take this rook with check but since white already castled the both the rooks are defending each other so there is no time to take on a1 it's it's not such a good idea so in this position knight takes b3 don't give uh, don't give black any sort of advantage so in the game chernikov played bishop to f6 i'm sorry i'm pronouncing his name not, I'm not pronouncing his name properly. The name is Chernikov. I'm, sometimes I say Chernikov, but it's Chernikov. So in the game, Chernikov played bishop f6. And there is a, an interesting story about this position. Uh, there, as the story goes, uh, in this position, they said, people that were there said that uh, Chernikov was walking around and he just waited for Nezhmedinov to offer a draw because he kind of expected the, the continuation of queen h4, uh, queen h6, bishop g7, and then queen h4 and bishop f6, you see the queen is under attack. She just go back and forth, and there is no good way to make progress. That's what Chernikov thought. Uh, but after castling bishop f6, I mean, white cannot really just play anything. You don't want to go either to h3 or to g4 because it's he's standing on this uh, long diagonal with the bishop and black would be just able to play d5 and it's somewhat uncomfortable. And playing queen g3, it's practically wrong. You see the knight has an access to e2 square with a fork. So most likely queen takes c3 uh, would be a good idea because after b takes c3, knight e2 check. King h1, knight takes g3, h takes g3, and bishop takes c3. Uh, in this position, black is up a pawn. And uh, once again, black is not winning or, any, or anything. White has some activity with bishop h6, maybe. But white is just down a pawn. And he has this double pawns. Uh, and he don't have such a, such a huge initiative. So, I mean, white will be the one that's struggling for a draw in this game. So, there is no many good moves in this position. And like the, st the story tells that uh, Rashid started thinking for 20, 30, 40 minutes. I will even link, leave a link in the description down below to the video which I, sh which I watched before recording this video, um, not just before recording this video, a couple of years ago, I watched a video about uh, Rashid Nezhmedinov. It was like a 40 minutes video, 40 minutes long. And the, the video tell about probably his whole life story. It's so informational. So in this video, they told like, you know, she started, think, started thinking for 20, 30, 40, 20, 30, 40 minutes. 
and uh, Chernikov was just walking around waiting for Rashi to offer a draw. And at that moment, uh, there was like an excited boy that went on to ch went on to Chernikov, and he t told him, "Mister, he sacrificed his queen to you." And then Chernikov came to the board, and so queen takes f6. Uh, hilarious! I mean, queen takes f6. They said that Chernikov uh, wasn't walking around anymore. They didn't saw Chernikov walking around anymore during the game because this is such an amazing queen sacrifice. You see, first of all, if e takes f6, then simply bishop takes d4, and white is about to play knight d5. And white's main goal here, although he sacrificed his queen for only two pieces, for a knight and a bishop, white is preparing to play knight to d5. And white has a grip over the d5 square. There is no piece that can challenge the knight on d5 once the knight goes to d5, there is no pawn like on e7 or c7 that can chase this knight away. And there is a huge problem with the f6 square and these dark squares around black's king. So in the game, black could just take the queen immediately, but he will he realize that if he takes the queen, we will have this position. So he played, first of all, knight to e2 check, knight takes e2, and then he took the queen because once white played knight c3, because the square, the knight square is on d5. Uh, and previously we had this position. We could have reached this position, but now we have this position, which is, which is somewhat preferable for black, somewhat better than the previous line. So here black played rook e8, attacking the pawn on e4. I mean, the pawn is defended, but he just wanted to make sure the knight wouldn't move because he must stay in touch with the e4 pawn. But uh, Rashid moved the knight and defended the e4 pawn tactically with knight to d5. Now the pawn cannot be captured because there is a concrete threat on the f6 square, so black defended with rook to e6 and white increased the pressure with bishop to d4, preparing a knight takes f6 check. So black played king g7 defending and now simply rook from a to d1 uh, preparing a, roof, a rook lift on the third rank. So black played d6, freeing his light square bishop and trying to get his rook to, to participate in the game. White played rook to d3, bishop to d7, and now rook to f3, increasing the pressure on f6. But just keep in mind, look at this position. After rook d1, there is no such a good way to get rid of this knight. There is nothing that can oppose him. I mean, the queen would never take the knight. Um, so it's quite difficult. There is a lot of compensation for the sacrificed queen. So after rook d3, bishop d7, rook f3, black, black just played bishop to b5, attacked the rook on e1, try, tried to get some initiative, you know, to, to get something going. He thought maybe the rook will move to, e, to d1 and then there is bishop to e2 fork or maybe the rook must go to some awkward square because if rook c1, the rook is not really participating in the game and queen d2 would force, you see, it's a fork. It's attacking the bishop and the rook on c1, so it probably would force bishop to c3, bishop to e3. And black can deflect white pieces to go backward. So this is maybe a compensation. I hope you see Najmedino's photo here behind me. Uh, never mind, let's go back to the game. After bishop b5, Rashid didn't care about the rook on f1. He simply played knight takes f6. Uh, oh, like, sorry, if he first played bishop c3, chased, he just kicked the black's queen. And after queen b8, only now he took on f6. And uh, black played bishop to e2, which is such, it's not, it's not a good move. I mean, bishop takes f1 was not, not as was also quite a bad move, but I mean, bishop e2, you just what? You're attacking the rook on, on f3. Because if you want to take bishop e2, it's not really like black is doing a fork. Because if he wanted to take the rook on f1, he could do it straight away. But bishop e2 is just attacking the rook on f3. It's not doing all that much. I mean, if bishop takes f1 immediately it would be played, then now there is just knight g4, which is extremely annoying for black because there is no good way to, to defend, because let's get, say, for example, you try to block the check with f6. 
and simply bishop takes f6, bishop takes e6 and bishop takes f6 to follow so for example if you want to analyze it even deeper there is bishop e2 bishop takes f6 check fork so queen takes rook takes and bishop takes and now there is simply check king g8 maybe there is even a better line i'm just showing a very very simple line that I see giving that is giving white an advantage. So check if king f8, there is no, there isn't this tactic. Because if rook takes h7, bishop takes e6, and the bishop can go back to g8 to block. So probably I'm missing something here. Let me see. I mean, even the bishop takes g4, playing down the exchange for two pawns is good enough. But I'm sure there is even a better line that I'm overlooking right now. Well, check. Oh, I'm so so dumb. Just bishop to d5 is so so easy. I mean, white is you shouldn't play like rook e7, rook f7, rook f6. Just bishop d5. I hope you saw it. Bishop d5 so easy. White is simply up two pawns. Is about to take on b7 with check, and black is completely lost down two pawns without any counterplay, an exposed king, and couple of weaknesses. So yeah, this is pretty much a lost position for black. So for example, after knight g4, I want to analyze even moves such as king g8. Of course, king wouldn't go to f8 because if king f8, uh, as you can see, the, the, the f-pawn is simply pinned. You can, you can take the rook on e6, the f-pawn is pinned. So if king g8, then you can simply take the rook on e6 and the bishop is untouchable because there is knight h6 checkmate. So you just take the rook for free and now you're threatening to destroy the f7 square with knight h6, one, two, three, four pieces against the poor black king and there is no defenses. So let's go back after knight xf6, bishop e2 was played, but black missed a very important tactic. So feel free to pause the video and find the tactic that uh, Rashid Nejmeddinov uh, played in this position. So go ahead and pause the video now. Okay, I hope you found it. Well, the move which Rashid played, well, just before I show you, don't forget to drop a like to this video. Leave a thumbs up because this is really helping me and it helps grow this channel. So uh, in this position, Rashid played knight takes h7 check, discover check from the bishop, and the knight is untouchable because if knight takes h, if king takes h7, then simply rook takes f7 check, removing the defender of the rook on e6. And whatever black plays here is completely lost because if king h6, then simply bishop takes e6 and you can count the material here. Uh, white only has a rook and a bishop against the rook bishop and like three pawns for a queen, which is also, which by itself it's enough. But just to give you a simple line, if bishop takes f1, then bishop g7 check. The king can never go to the seventh rank because there is bishop f6 check from the rook and you pick up the queen. So king h5 and now g4. If the king goes, the king has only two legal moves. King h4 and king to g5. Of course, if king g5, white can simply play the f4 and force the king to h4 anyways. So king h4 and now simply king takes f1 and I'm not going to go any further, further because white is simply threatening bishop f6, forking the king and the queen. And if the king moves, I mean, Black king is completely exposed. There is no way he will survive such an attack. The queen and the rook are not participating in the game and the king is on his own against two bishops, rook, three pawns, and even the king that can take away a few squares. So uh, yeah, this is an extremely difficult position to play. Uh, uh, this is an extremely difficult position to play. Oh, sorry, I have a problem with the internet. So the video is cut off for a moment. Yeah, I'm sorry. This was the position. I mean, after knight takes h7, black couldn't take the knight on h7, so he just played king g8. And now rook h3, transferring the rook from the h3, he can. There is some mating pattern with rook h8 when the bishop guard, the bishop stays on this diagonal. So black played uh, rook e5, tried to block this bishop. Once again, if bishop takes f1, and simply knight g5 with a concrete threat of a rook h8 mate. 
and there is no stopping. I mean, the best move is just King F8 to make sure Rook H8 wouldn't be a mate, but it still wins the queen. You see, Rook takes, Rook takes, um, Bishop takes, probably there is even better, like, Knight X is possible, I'm just wondering. Uh, I'm just wondering, maybe there is even a better line. Uh, no, you can just take it with whatever you want. Knight X E6 and King takes F1. You can see in this position, white has two bishops and two pawns against the rook, which is way too much. I mean, even two bishops against the rook, is it's already an advantage, but white also has here two pawns, which is, uh, uh, such a big advantage. So let's go back to the game. This wasn't played. Uh, Black played rook e5 in order to block the dark square bishop. And Rashid was not even interested in taking this rook because the bishop is such a powerful piece. He, he, he always keeping the mating pattern with the bishop on c3 and the rook on h8. So he never really, really wanted to trade this dark square bishop. So he just played f4, attacking the rook. So bishop takes f1 was played in the game. And white played king takes f1. He didn't even took the rook because he realized the rook cannot move anyways. Because if the king takes, if the rook moves, there is also always this knight g5. And then once again, there is a concrete mating threat on h8 because the bishop still remains on c3. So the rook can't move, so black played rook c8. And once again, taking the rook on e5 was possible, but Rashid loved his bishop, his bishop so much. He didn't want to allow any type of, of exchange sacrifice on c3, so he just played bishop to d4 to make sure black cannot give his rook for the bishop on c3. So in this position, black played b5. I mean, I tried to enter it here, rook h5 line, to, to just to show you if black tried to, uh, to challenge the white rook on the h file, then, then there is simply a knight f6 check. King f8, of course, the king can't stay on the, this diagonal with the, light, with the dark square bishop. So king f8, and now knight takes, pawn takes, rook takes. Yeah, black's position is very tough. Uh, white is just about to transfer his rook either to h8 to win the queen or to play rook f5 to win the pawn on f7 with check because the bishop defends. And white's position is very consolidated. Keep in mind, the f pawn will probably fall and uh, then black will remain with three pawns and white will remain with seven pawns plus the bishop pair and the initiative. So black was not interested in this, so he played b5. I'm not sure what's the purpose of b5. Maybe he just wanted to play rook c4 to block this light square bishop, even to give up the exchange, but just to make sure the bishop is not participating in the game. But it was way too slow. In the game, Rashid played knight to g5, and he created here a terrible threat. In the game, Black just played rook c7 to defend the f7 pawn. He saw knight g5 attacking the pawn on f7, so he played rook c7 to defend it. Uh, but he overlooked an amazing tactic. So feel free to pause the video and find out what is, uh, how Rashid managed to win this position. So go ahead and, and pause the video now. Okay, I hope you paused the video. The move which Rashid played was uh, uh, bishop takes f7. Just keep in mind there is much faster and easier win. It was bishop takes e5. Once again, threatening a mate on h8. So black would be forced to capture. This wasn't played in the game. The game bishop takes f7 was played. But if bishop takes on e5 and d takes e5, now bishop takes f7 is even stronger because after rook takes f7, rook h8, if the king moves, we can just take the queen and white will remain with an extra knight. So. And uh, most likely, yeah, so king must take, and now knight takes f7. And anyway, white will take the black queen, and white will remain up a knight, a whole knight in the end game. So black would be forced to play king g7, but anyways, knight e6 check, king takes f7, knight takes d8. White is still up a knight, and this position is completely winning. So this was probably the easiest and the fastest way to win for Rashid. But in the game, he just played bishop takes f7 immediately. Rook takes f7, and still the, the same tactic, rook h8 check. King takes h8, and the knight takes f7. The only difference here, you see that after king h7, knight takes e3, and knight takes d8, white didn't have had the chance to trade his dark square bishop for the rook on e5 which makes white win a little bit more difficult, but still white's position is completely winning. 
After rook takes e4, which was played in the game, knight c6, rook takes f4, and king e2 in this position, black uh, Oleg Chernikov, Chernikov simply resigned because in this position, white has the knight, bishop, and a pawn against the rook, and there is also a few weaknesses, few pawn islands, and black didn't want to play this position, so he just resigned. Of course, it was kind of premature. Black could play for a couple of more moves, but at the end, he knew that the rook alone cannot outplay the knight, bishop, and a pawn. Plus, black king is not that active, and black has few weaknesses, so he just resigned the game. So I hope you liked this video. If you like, if you did, then feel free to share it with your friend. I'm trying to grow this channel, and if you share this video, it's helping me grow this channel. So thanks for doing that. For, thanks for doing that. So if you want me to show more games that were played by Rashid, then feel free to comment down below Rashid Nezmedinov or just Rashid, and I will uh, put more games about him uh, later. So thank you all for watching, and I will see you in the next video. Goodbye.